Okay, this uh, screen capture is being done for MRK 460 on Friday, July 15th, talking about the different things in the course that would have been done in May, June, and some of the things we're doing in the first couple of weeks of July. So, again, just to remind students that they should always check the grading evaluation so they know what's been done so far, your video assignment, your online material. The global business plan is the last thing we do, which is 20%. And the video of the company is at 20%. There's no final exam or anything else like that. All right. Okay. In class today on Friday, we did a little bit of a review of the importance of understanding the different types of opportunities and also a little bit about product development diversification. And also we talked about product orientation, market orientation, and sales orientation. This video right here, and this one accompanying it, is probably one of the most important things in the whole course you could ever look at. When you do your report, you should talk about the three or the four P's of the company and also maybe four or five, maybe six of these environments that influence your company. Right? Most important would be, of course, talk about the competitive environment. So in the case of Air Canada, you talk about WestJet. In the case of Maple Leaf Foods, you talk about McCain Foods. In the case of Bombardier, you talk about the other companies like Skidoo and so on. Well, Skidoo is a subproduct of Bombardier, but you talk about Arctic Cat and the other ones like that. Then this was something that I wanted to make sure everybody took time to look at, the three sources of information, how you get information. This video here talks about me, how I got information from the Japanese government and the Canadian government to do business in Tokyo many years ago by networking with the industry associations. And this is also talking about the uh, corporate web pages and where you get the information about the media releases and press releases at the very bottom of the web page for investors. I use that. So basically, we just say this is divided into sort of three general categories uh, information from the government, like embassies and consulates, information from trade associations, like the Canadian Association of Clothing Manufacturers, and corporate information. All right. Then we talked about globalization and sustainability and the cultural environment which I'll talk to you by Professor Jason Varo Marketing he would have touched that even though I wrote the section on it here ethics is a big section it's also the section four in the textbook is also the chapter that I wrote in the textbook so you would make sure that you talk about something to do with corporate social responsibility to your stakeholders maybe three or five or four or five of these groups are affected by uh, whether the company has good corporate social responsibility and you might also even have a chance to talk about a couple of whistleblowers. I think there was a whistleblower for Air Canada one time, and there's maybe also one for Maple Leaf Foods. All right, uh, stakeholders. Okay, product orientation, sales orientation, and marketing orientation. Please, please watch this video. It's very, very useful in helping understand whether you talk about the physical features of the product or the price of the product or why you would want to use this product to solve your problems. And then we're into the political environment. Uh, embassies, consulates, and high commissions. Uh, and I wanted to make sure people understood that an embassy is in the capital city of a country. So Canada has an embassy in Washington. We don't have an embassy in New York because it's bigger, but we call it the consulate general. So consulates are in the smaller government offices across the country. So there'd be a consulate general in Los Angeles. There'd be a consulate in Texas, a consulate in Florida, places like that. Uh, contingency planning and political risk very important to discuss contingency planning because that's how in dangerous times you're able to retain your businesses and your operating capacity when the threat is no longer in existence and you can restart more effectively to maintain your customers. And talked also about personal risk situations as well because international business means going places. And that was the first half of the course. I just put that picture in here sort of as an easy visual marker. Now, I've talked a couple of times about doing business with government, and we have a couple of examples of some of the companies that you're doing for your final group project. The Friday class has Air Canada, Maple Leaf Foods, and Bombardier for their three groups. All those companies do business with the government. Air Canada flies Canadian military soldiers on airplanes to different places. Uh, Maple Leaf Foods is institutional food, so they provide food for uh, served in <laughs> prisons to prisoners and uh, you know school cafeterias. Bombardier also produces a product for government uh, such as subway cars and uh, 
railroad trains and so on. Then government's influence on trade, uh, tariffs and subsidies. Some of you like this uh, video with the way I sort of pimped it up with a little bit of the graphics. But basically the whole point there is the reason why government does those things is to maintain the competitiveness of the companies in the country. Because if they can maintain their competitiveness, it also means that they can be more profitable. That means they can be taxed and that can allow the government to provide more services. A dumping on the CBSA. This is a very, many students said that this is a very good example of how to make something very simple and short and sweet. Why a company would sell its product for a cheaper price overseas than to the people in the country it came from. A good example being uh, Japan. It's very easy to buy a Nikon camera in New York City and Hong Kong, but if you buy a Nikon camera in Japan, you're going to pay full price. Why? Because the Japanese government has a tax on incoming cameras from Korea and from China. So that's the, the way dumping works. The physical environment and weather extremes. Uh, this is a long video, but there's many good points in it talking about contingency plans and there's a phrase there the tyranny of quarterly earnings which you should learn because I'm going to ask you about that um, weather extremes in all different categories and how they affect business and food production because this a lot of students have commented to me that they found that very interesting because they didn't know how many different ways food production can be affected first of all weather in the growing season when the plants are growing in the fields. Then secondly, when you want to harvest, when you want to cut the plants down, can you get the machinery into the fields without it being clogged up with mud? And then thirdly, when the agricultural products then get processed and sent off to the people that are buying it, both in the stores and also the large companies like McCain Foods and, uh, and Maple Leaf Foods for processing into all kinds of products that we have. And the geographic environment in terms of where, because don't forget, when we talk about international business, it's a where thing. And I thought it was good to have these discussions about maps so people could understand where people live. And the, particularly the one about the United States, why there's so many people here instead of here. It's a history thing. It's not necessarily a geography thing. The land is okay here, except for the, you know, the mountain range here. But this is because most of the people to the United States came from Europe, the countries of England, France, Germany, Scotland, Ireland some from Spain and so on, back in the 1700s. This so over a period of time, Americans have spread out through this part of the United States, but this is why this part here is larger in population than this part. And when we looked at the example for the situation in China, we found it's kind of a, di a little bit different. The reason for this uh, distribution of most of the people in China living here instead of here is geography. Uh, this is a very mountainous region between India and China. Uh, the way the Earth's crust is always folding and creating these high mountains. And this interior part here is mostly a dry desert with very little arable land, meaning land for cultivating. And this is uh, Mongolia as well. All right, then we started talking about the different countries in the world. And a lot of people don't really think much about this, but they know that India and, and uh, China are, you know, 1.3, 1.4 billion people, but who's next? Is there anything with 700 million or 500 million? No, you have to go all the way down to the United States with 330 million. Now, this is why the U.S. is such a big country and so powerful. There's no other country that's close to it, right? Indonesia, Pakistan, Brazil. Yes, those countries have big populations, but their per capita GDP is very, very low. The number of universities in this country is low. The economy is poor. So this is why the United States is one of the most powerful countries in the world is because very simply, there's many Americans. There's 300 million Americans. Um, indicators of economic supremacy. Yeah, we talked about planes, trains, and automobiles. And the idea was that if you could pick a country that had the capacity to make airplanes, they'd probably have a pretty good infrastructure, wouldn't they? If you picked a country that could make trains for passenger locomotives and so on, if you could pick a country that was good enough in their economy and technology to make cars, and lastly, uh, electronic devices. Then if you look at Canada, Canada is about all those countries. But the interesting thing about Canada is we're very small, 35 million people. Russia is like five times the size of that. U.S. is 10 times the size of that. India and China are 1,000 times the size of that. So this is why Canada is such a unique and special country because the people in Canada are able to produce things way above the level that you would normally ascribe to a country of only 35 million people. We talked a little bit about the OECD as well as a source of information. And we talked about statistics that they produce that help people make decisions like education funding, for example. 
And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the World Trade Organization next class and the foreign exchange market and the IMF versus the World Bank. And then we're going to talk about, this is a big subject for next week, collaborative relationships, meaning things companies do with other companies to be able to do business. We'll talk about strategic alliances, acquisitions, consortiums, contract manufacturing, and so on. This is a student of mine at U of T Scarborough many years ago that made actually a funny video about this, which I beg you to watch because then you'll understand what all these terms are. And we'll also talk some of the strategies and tactics like counter trade, and I'll tell you why Pepsi was able to do business with the Russian military to get submarines out of Russia. Yeah, for real. And then we'll talk about trade missions. And we'll talk about some of the disadvantages of exporting, why a company should either wait or be better prepared before they go. And some also some terms about export financing and letters of credit. And then we'll get into some kind of interesting things about outsourcing and offshoring. And that will be the end of the course leading up with the subject of TQM, total quality management, and some things about uh, just-in-time and HR staffing policies. So that is your course, MRK 460.